Hey all, Brie from the No Guilt Mom podcast, and I have got a gift for you this holiday season. If you love the No Guilt Mom podcast, and I mean love the No Guilt Mom podcast, then tell us about it. Leave us a review and you can be entered to win a No Guilt Mom gift card. All you have to do is leave a review, take a screenshot, and then simply go to noguiltmom.com forward slash review to enter our giveaway for a free No Guilt Mom gift card. Simply for telling us what you think about the podcast. It is amazing. But don't delay. Get right on this as we're going to be giving away that No Guilt Mom gift card on December 21st. So get right on over and visit noguiltmom.com forward slash review. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. I am your host, Joanne Crone, joined here by my co-host, Bree Tucker. Wow, hello, hello, but how are you? <laughs> We're digging in today to some screen time, Bree. Yeah, I have to tell you, this has been weighing on me so much lately. Screen time has come up both with No Guilt Mom, but also like with my own family because we took a vacation in March where we went on a cruise and I refused to tell my kids that there was Wi-Fi. So yeah, they didn't, they didn't know how to get on the Wi-Fi. And I have to admit, like, even though you've heard me talk about it, like I would have liked some things to have gone differently with the cruise line and my kids to have made some different choices in terms of socializing with people, which they did not, but that's okay. That's okay. They socialized me <laughs> a ton. Um, we got so much family time. It really gave me a glimpse of what life is like when we extract those devices. And I got to admit, I really, really loved it. I didn't think it was possible, but it was, and it was amazing. Well, that's excellent. It's so funny with me. Like people are like, oh yeah, family time without screens. I don't remember a time, even in my childhood that we didn't have screens. Like we were the house that had a television in every single house. Like there was a television at the kitchen table. There was a television in the bedrooms, like everywhere was screens. So like, even now in my home, we don't have TVs. We have two and then there's screens, but usually it is quiet and there's not that TV noise in our house. And we talk during dinner instead of watching the TV, uh, which I think is different from how I grew up. So it's always interesting when, especially when we're talking to Andrea, you're going to hear her and what she does in her family. And I was like, wow, I never experienced that as a kid, but oh, I, my, yeah. my childhood was great. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a great I mean, childhood. I would say for our generation, it's really hard to think of a time when you didn't have a screen. It really mm-hmm. is. I mean, and if you did, you were the exception, not the norm. And yeah. in this day and age, we struggle as parents trying to figure out where that balance is. And I think that's why just bringing in as much information as we possibly can is so helpful. And yeah. Andrea was so helpful with this. She's so helpful. (laughs) Like I always tell people, I watched TV so much as a kid. I thought I made a career out of it. And that's, I went into television. (laughs) I knew so much about it. I knew so much about it. So, and that didn't work out for various reasons, but not for my TV (laughs) habits. A story for another day, but you are going to love our interview with Andrea Davis. She's the founder of Better Screen Time and the author of Creating a Tech Healthy Family, which you can find on Amazon. She helps parents worry less about tech and connect more with their kids, which we are all about here at No Guilt Mom. So we hope you enjoy our interview with Andrea. You want mom life to be easier. That's our goal too. Our mission is to raise more self-sufficient and independent kids, and we're going to have fun doing it. We're going to help you delegate and step back. Each episode, we'll tackle strategies for positive discipline, making our kids more responsible and making our lives better in the process. Welcome to the No Guilt Mom podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Andrea. And we are so excited to have you here today because I I love your work. And I think it's so refreshing to hear somebody talk about how screen time can be used for good, as well as being aware of the dangers and educating kids about it. So I totally dig you and welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be with you guys. 
So with your whole screen time journey as a family, first of all, tell us a little bit about your family because you have a rather large one. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have five kids. Our oldest is 18 and our youngest is eight. And we have four girls and one boy. That is a big spread. You've yes. got a lot of ages there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I cover the gamut. A lot. Yes. And what is your background too? Yes. So my background is in secondary education. So before I stayed home with my kids, I actually taught junior high. I taught a couple mm. of semesters of college. So I love teaching, but I've spent quite a number of years at home with my kids. So just education is my background. <laughs> Yeah, I would have bet that you were an educator before you got into this work, just yes. the way you approach it. I'm a former educator as well. I was a fifth grade teacher before oh, awesome. No Guilt Mom. Yeah. And I think like as educators, we kind of like approach this whole parenting thing, kind of coming from the classroom, knowing that for kids to do things that you need them to do, you have to teach them how to do it because no arbitrary age that they just wake up and they're like, oh, I suddenly have all this new skills and maturity to handle these things. Yes. And in your book, Creating a Tech Healthy Family, you mention you're like the story that kind of got you into this line of work. Can you share that with us? Yes. So first off, everyone needs to know that we are the family that's kept our TV in the closet. So we only pulled it out for the Olympics and family movie night. And when my kids were little, I I loved, I just wanted them to be readers. So I had a really good friend who was an amazing reader. And I just asked her one day, I said, Rachel, what did your friends do to instill this love of reading? And she said, oh, well, we didn't have a TV growing up. And I was just fascinated by that. And so I went home and I told my husband, Tyler, I said, hey, what would you think if we just put the TV in the closet? We'll pull it out for a family movie night for the Olympics. And he's not really into sports. So it was an easy sell. And it was, that's what we <laughs> did for years and years. Yeah, emphasized other things in our home. And, you know, we had a desktop computer. So our kids still did that. But again, this was kind of a different era. Well, fast forward years later, and my oldest was suddenly in middle school. And we had a big cross-country move. We moved from Illinois to Oregon, where we now live. And yeah. my daughter's friends were starting to get phones. And we were moving to this place where we didn't know anyone. So we had this abandoned smartphone that no one was using. And we handed, over, handed it over to our daughter, thinking this will be a great way for her to stay in touch with these friends that she left behind. Because moving in middle school is not fun. And also then mm -hmm. she can get in touch with me to know where to get off the bus. And really just logistically, it seemed to make sense, right? Well, fast forward a few months later and my daughter came home from school one day and she was eating her after school snack, her bowl of cereal. So she's spinning cereal into her mouth with one hand and with her other hand, she's doing this. She's scrolling and not talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that this device was, had become a wedge in our relationship. And I thought, Hey, where did my kid go? Like what happened here? And then a few more months passed and I was in the kitchen leaning over the kitchen table, looking at my own phone scrolling. And I came across a post for my daughter and it was her lip syncing the words to a song about a Glock and she had her hand to her head like a gun. And at that moment, mm -hmm. it pulled a trigger inside of me and I realized, oh my goodness, I have failed her. This was way too much too soon. So we actually went back to a flip phone. That's really all that was available six years ago. There weren't kids safe phones like there are now. And it was not a fun experience. There were lots of tears. Uh, it was upsetting for her. It was hard for us to admit that we'd made the mis mistake. And we just decided we need to reset. We're going to start this over. And I realized that parents needed a lot more guidance and help when it came to technology. And we can err on the side of really protecting our kids and we need to protect them, but also we may not be preparing them the way that we should be and, and really taking this process deliberately and slowly. So that's why I started Better Screen Time. Wow. Yeah. And something about your story, I think that many parents can relate to that. And also 
without this guidance existing, you just don't know what can happen with kids and technology and what is too much too soon and what they do need to be exposed to and what they do need to learn. Because it's funny, you say your daughter scrolling through her phone when she's eating. I have these conversations with my 14-year-old all the time because I noticed that behavior. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the the huge things that scares me about technology use, especially among, among teens today, is that they're not talking to each other. They're just totally absorbed in their own devices. And it scares me even more than the aspect of them viewing content online. Because if you can't talk to people, you can't process what you see. You can't really get out of situations and handle emotions and that sort of thing. So just being prepared for that. So what now after doing that, what did you see that you did differently with your younger kids? Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're hitting that time of year where my brain gets so overloaded in December that I look for anything to make life easier. And I have to say, Brie, that Green Chef is one of those services. Yes. Green Chef is there to take away the dreaded, oh my goodness, what are we going to eat for dinner tonight? You can eat clean all holiday long with over 80 weekly meal options each week featuring things like quick and easy, protein packed, calorie smart, or my personal favorite, the keto options. And you don't have to lose track of healthy eating habits during the holidays because because every Green Chef customer gets a free session with one of their registered dietitians who can walk you through how to make clean eating work for you, which is very cool. And I have to say that I have been loving their recipes lately. They put things together I have never thought of. This week, we're trying the lemon basil caper pork with sauteed cauliflower, bell peppers, almonds, and feta cheese, my favorite. Their recipes make it so easy to support my wellness goals without skipping on flavor. For Green Chef's best deal of the year, get $250 off with code NGM250 at greenchef.com slash NGM250. That's greenchef.com slash NGM250. And don't forget to use that code NGM250 to get $250 off. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. It is so hard to raise kids who know how to manage money. Brie, right now, my kids are all about earning money for presents. My daughter wants to get presents for all of her friends, and my son is doing a secret Santa with his friends. Oh, I hear you. And if you're looking to raise kids that are financially responsible, we have got a lifesaver recommendation for you that you need to check out. It is Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families that gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy all while giving parents peace of mind. You can send instant money transfers, automate allowance, and even keep an eye on kids' spending with real-time notifications. Meanwhile, your kids can begin their journey towards financial autonomy by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. So sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash NGM. That's greenlight.com slash NGM to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash NGM. So what now after doing that, what did you see that you did differently with your younger kids? Well, initially after that experience, I was panicked. I started reading a lot of books, uh, Glow Kids, Reset Your Child's Brain, iGen. I mean, all these books that were really kind of on the front end of this screen time topic. And I was really starting to panic. I started to parent from a place of fear. And as I sat the kids down, my husband and I, I was just going through this list of rules. Like we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing that. This, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the kids were just looking at me like deer in the headlights and shrugging their shoulders. And oh my goodness, mom is freaking out. And I had to pause and just have this moment of self-reflection and realize, you know, when I was in the classroom and was teaching, was this an effective way to get my students on board? And the answer is no, right? And you know that as an educator, like the best way to get people on board is to help them understand why, why this matters and to get their input and they need to be part of the solution. And so it was at that point when I realized, okay, we're going to approach this differently. 
We'll sit down together. We're going to first talk about technology as a tool. So we made a thumbs up and a thumbs down list. And I just asked her kids, I said, okay, thumbs up. What are the things that you love about tech? And we made a big long list and then thumbs down. Okay, what do we need to watch out for with it when it comes to tech? And we made a long list there too. And it's such a powerful exercise. And I recommend anyone listening that you do this with your kids because it teaches them the skill, which is the skill of discernment. And that is a skill to be able to tell the difference between good and bad. And they have to recognize that, that mm-hmm. yes, technology is a tool. It can be used for good and bad. But at some point, that's going to be on me, my choice to have to decide this. And my parents are helping me now, but they're not always going to be right there, right? So we started with that. And then we worked into our next conversation was about actually creating a family tech plan. And we talked about where will we use screens? What will we do on them? How long? All those all those W questions, where, when, what, how long? And then we just talked about this as a family. What are some non-negotiables? And I, of course, came to the conversation with some agenda items, but at the same time, really trying to listen to my kids. And one of those things that I felt very strongly about, especially after doing a lot of research, was that we would only use screens in shared spaces. So in our family room and the kitchen and the office area and not taking screens in the bedrooms. And that was tough because the kids said, hey, mom, you take your screen in the bedroom. And I was like, Uh you're right, I do. And so it was at that moment that I decided, you know, not only do I want to model this for my kids, but I know I'll benefit as well. So that was six years ago. And I've, I've committed to that ever since, not taking my phone or my laptop into the bedroom. And I've gained so much from that. And so I think, you know, parents are just like, where do I start with my kids? It really is with having those conversations and creating that family tech plan, getting your kids to share their input, and then just realizing that you kind of have to pick your battle. I heard this line once, pick your battles wisely and then win them. So there are a few things that might (laughs) be, this is what we need to do. And other things you might need to compromise a little bit and baby step into it, basically. Well, I love how you started that because I think a lot of times when we're having these conversations about screen use, tech use, especially phones, right? Our kids, and it, and I feel like this is true for almost every age, they come battling. They come with their heels dug in. They're ready to, to go to fight for it because they feel like you're an adult. They immediately assume your agenda is to take it away from them and to not let them do stuff. And I love how you said, like, coming in with the whole, what do we love about tech, what we don't love about tech, because that gives you the end. You get to see what they not only already understand as being the negative sides of it, but what they see as the negative side. So that's how you can choose your battles wisely, right? You can take yes. like, what they already identified and be like, okay, this is, that's my end. That's my end. <laughs> yes. No, it's like exactly. the motivational interviewing technique. <laughs> where, like, yeah. where you're like, oh, tell me more about this bad side about technology. Yeah. Yeah. What do you like even, about it? Hadn't even thought of that. Of that. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Tell me more. So I, I love about what you said about discernment, because I think this is the most important thing that we can do with our kids in tech, because like you said, they're not going to be with us all the time. They need to know the difference between right and wrong. And the last thing I want my kids to do is to be like, oh my gosh, my mom never lets me do this. Let's do this right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, because I feel yeah. like that's a pretty natural tendency of kids. Totally. I would do it as a kid, definitely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so discernment, I think, is just such an important skill when it comes to tech. Yeah, for sure. What other skills or tools or things is it important to teach kids when they have this phone? You said yeah. already like using it in shared spaces. What else could they do? Yeah. So I think having a conversation about, you know, times of day when we should have screens put away, like dinner time or having a certain time in the evening where everybody puts devices away so that you can unwind for bed and have that time to relax and also to reconnect as a family. I think that's really important. Of course, that will vary from family to family. So that's why I think it's so valuable to 
have that, this conversation with your kids and decide, well, what, mm-hmm. what works for us? What's like that? I always tell families, like pick your screen free family rituals. What are those things that just are part of your family? If that's a walk after dinner or it's a family game night on Friday, picking a few of those things and trying to keep those screen free. It's really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then I think just talking about what kind of content is appropriate, what's not, why, you know, how does it affect us? And then we actually just this, that's how we kicked off our, these conversations we had with our kids, which we put in our discussion guide called creating a tech healthy family. And that's on Amazon. But we started with the pros and cons of tech, creating a family tech plan. And then we talked a lot about rules and how rules actually keep us safe. and. I think that's a valuable conversation as well, that this technology is amazing. It's a tool, but we do need to have boundaries. And if those boundaries don't exist, then we are going to get in trouble. And I think the best comparison really is just the rules of the road, right? Thinking about the chaos and mayhem Mm -hmm. that can happen if we're not following traffic laws. And the same thing applies when using our devices. We also had a lot of conversations about self-awareness. Because again, I think it's important for the kids to understand, like, how do you feel if you were to sit and watch YouTube for three hours after that amount of time? Mm -hmm. Like, how are you feeling? Are you feeling sluggish? Are you feeling motivated? Did you get all these other things done that need to get done in a day, like your homework and getting some physical activity? And we talk to our kids a lot about putting those important things in place first, right? The things that keep us healthy, both both physically and mentally healthy. Mm-hmm. Because we, if we spend too yeah. much time on a screen, then we're missing out on those things that are going to truly keep us in line, basically. Yeah. And I love having the discussion too, because if you have the discussion and set the stage, then there's a time where the kids actually do need to practice the self-awareness and fail. It's one thing being told that, okay, you have to turn off your screen right now, else you're going to be mentally healthy. And it's another thing to be like, oh my gosh, mom, I still have this, this, and this to do. And I haven't done any of it. And it's like, well, what have you been doing? Oh, I've been on, I've been on my screen. Because yeah. I think a lot of parents hear hear this information and they're like, oh my gosh, now I need to watch my kids to make sure that they, or they do this already, the policing of screen time, where the kids never experience that feeling of having all of your time sucked away and you don't have the time to do what you actually want to do. Well, I was going to say, and I don't think that they necessarily, as kids, that they believe us that that can happen if you've been policing it. Oh, Mm -hmm. there's no way I would get lost on my phone for hours. I'm way smarter than that. Because again, it's all about that experience, right? So I think that that's a really important thing there too. If you're policing it, you're keeping them from understanding that that legit can happen. Yeah. I also think it's important to recognize and consider ages and stages here. Because obviously what we would do with a three and a four-year-old is very different than what we would do with a 16-year-old. So I want to clarify clarify that. There's a couple of reasons why self-regulation on a screen for kids really is not possible. And number one Mm -hmm. is it's important to understand their brain is still under construction, right? So the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that's responsible for decision-making isn't fully formed until we're in our mid-20s. And so you pair that with a device that uses something we call persuasive design. So a lot of the apps that are on the devices that we're using are designed to keep us hooked and keep us connected. Mm -hmm. And so you pair a brain that's under construction with an app that's using persuasive design, and it really is a losing battle. And so that's why I tell parents self-regulation on a screen for 99% of kids is a myth. It's not possible. So we do have to be there. We do have to create these boundaries and work with them and, and be there, be their accountability partner, basically. But as they get older, then you do start to slowly relinquish a little bit of that and let them experience like, okay, what homework assignments do you need to get done? And what time do you have left? And so I think it doesn't just come down to wasting time on a screen, but even most of our kids are doing their homework on a screen, which is a whole nother challenge, right? right? My high schooler has a smartphone and she'll 
have that sitting by her school iPad and I'll see her pick it up several times. And occasionally I'll say, Hey, do you want me to put your phone in the other room so you can focus? And it's kind (laughs) of just this playful thing because she knows I'm there to to help her. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten to that point and she's like, no mom, no mom, I got it. And then sometimes she'll set it over on the other side of the table So I think it's even just checking in with them rather than when they get to that point, rather than demanding, but almost offering, okay, I can be your accountability partner. Do you need some help so you can focus on your homework? And it takes some time to get to that point, but it's a good place to be because I mean, my oldest is 18. She's going to college this fall. And so hopefully she'll hear my voice in her head when she has those moments. She's going to have to do that. So that's the point we have to get to. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, all. Bree here, and I wanted to share one of my favorite gifts to give during the holiday season, a StoryWorth book. It is the most amazing gift ever. StoryWorth is an online service that lets you create a special and unique gift of someone's story. I've given StoryWorth books to both of my parents, and it has been their favorite gift, hands down. And did I mention it is so easy? StoryWorth emailed my parents questions every week that I handpicked from their massive list of questions that they have. All my parents had to do was open their email and answer them. That easy. I asked my dad questions like, did you have any rules that you set for yourself as a parent, which you immediately broke? And he did. I even asked both of my parents, are you more like your mom or your dad? And they shared a lot of really amazing qualities that I didn't know about my grandparents at the time. Then at the end of the year, StoryWorth compiles all of their answers, puts them into this gorgeous book that covers everything. My parents love showing us their books and I personally love getting a chance to read them. With StoryWorth, I am giving those I love, a thoughtful and personal gift from the heart that preserves their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash NGM and save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash NGM to save $10 on your first purchase. My son is playing a game right now on his computer where he's a thief and the cops are after him. So I'm so excited about this new app, Give As We Grow, where instead of being the quote unquote bad guys, kids are practicing giving back. That is so cool, Joanne. I really wish that there was something like this when my kids were younger that got them excited about giving back to others and helped them build a better understanding of what it really means to volunteer. Give As We Grow is the first of its kind free educational mobile app for children ages 8 to 11 that teaches kids via fun, service-focused mini game quests to tap into their unique talents and interests to help others. And did you know that studies show that there is a biological connection between generosity and happiness and that volunteering improves people's physical and mental health? I mean, kids who volunteer typically do better in school and are less likely to engage in risky behaviors, and that is something that I think we all want for our kids. Ready to spark a new movement in generosity? Find and download Give As We Grow for free in the App Store for Android and iOS. And for resources for the whole family, visit giveaswegrow.org. It's like the gradual weaning off, like in teaching at the I do, we do, you do, where like you gradually weed off the we do. Yeah. Uh, and when I, when I was talking about self-regulation, I was talking specifically about my high schooler. My nine-year-old is on a strict screen limit. We control hit the amount he spends on screens. We have constant check-in times with him, how he's feeling, making sure he's getting other things done, making sure all these yeah. other things are happening because the... the Everything is so addictive on there. It's so addictive that if you don't have that in place, you never have the chance to have those discussions with your kids because they're going to be glued to their screen the entire time. You're not going to be able to pull them off and everything's going to be a fight to have those discussions. So So like, do you have any recommendations for sort of like tools you could use to help you regulate that screen time for the younger ones in particular? Yeah, I think the the best tool you have is creating the family tech plan. And we always put ours on the refrigerator. So it's right there. Mm -hmm. We'll review it at least twice a year. You know, sometimes when you're just starting out, you might have to redo it several times before you kind of get to a place Mm -hmm. where everybody's happy. But we have that on the fridge. So it's not like, well, mom you said this, but it's like, no, actually it's written right here. This is how much time we get. I think that's one of the best tools. 
because again, you're kind of teaching them to, to understand that we have this plan together, this agreement, but my kids always use a timer. So whether that's a smart speaker or a visual timer, when my kids were little, I used the time timer, which has like a very visual red mark. You've probably seen that as a teacher and it, yeah, it goes back. So that's really mm-hmm. good for younger kids using a timer. And then if you want to get really technical, another tool that we love is our router. So we have a router, it's called the Griffin router. And we have an app on our phone and you can actually set what times you might allow screen time or not allow it. And you can set time limits on certain apps as well, which you can also do Mm with some of the built-in settings with like Apple screen time and Google family link and those kind of things as well. So Mm -hmm. I think those, you know, use those to help you, but I think the conversations and the family tech plan are your best bet because the, that goes, that's more like your kid's internal filter and that goes with them wherever they go. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think those are amazing, amazing things. Uh, Would you have any different advice for a family that may have already started like you were with your 12-year-old that has already started down the tech road, realizing, whoa, Nelly, I got to back this up. This has not worked out the way that we had hoped for whatever reason, maybe whatever reason it didn't work out. What is a way that they could probably do a reset with a kiddo that's like a tween or older? Yeah, I think it's a matter of looking at seeing what are the biggest pain points. So for example, maybe this preteen or teen has social media and you feel like that's the thing that is unhealthy for your teen or they're either wasting time or they're finding content that's not appropriate or in line with your family's values. All of the above. Yeah. All (laughs) all of the the above, above, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so maybe that's the thing that you scale back or that you eliminate for a while and it's painful, it's not fun, but your kids, they're still learning at that age and they only get one chance to grow up. I, when I go speak to kids, I love to talk to them about your brain's going through this pruning process, right? And it's deciding what it's going to hang on to and what it's going to let go of. And so if you're spending like five hours playing Fortnite or you're spending five hours scrolling Instagram, you are missing out on this wonderful opportunity that you have to go learn how to shoot a basketball, learn a song on the piano, learn a new language, even just like social skills of hanging out with friends. Those are missed opportunities. You don't get that back because you and I both know that once you become an adult, you have to get a job pay your own way. And you don't have that time to explore those skills, those opportunities in the way that you do at that age. So some kids get that and some kids don't, but I think that's a really important conversation to have is if you've got a teenager that's just spending tons of time on video games or social media, you find a way to scale back, whether it's getting rid of it for a while, or maybe they're on all the social media platforms and you're like, okay, we're going to pick one. And we're going to monitor that one closely and you get, and we're going to, let's decide how long do you think is a good amount of time? Like how much time do you actually have a day in a day to spend on YouTube or whatever? So let's limit that. So we have two online courses. One is called Creating a Tech Healthy Family and the other one is Untangling Teens in Tech. And in that teen course, we help the parent work with the teen individually to create a plan together. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like you have this family tech plan, but when they get older, You have to start to, again, give them a little bit more, not just freedom, but they need an individualized plan in a way. And so I think that's the best thing is sit down, make a plan with with your teen. And know that it's going to be a little painful at first. Yes, (laughs) it will be. (laughs) It's going to be a little painful. Just like when I have to give up sugar. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) Don't give up the sugar. Don't give up. Just like when I have to give up the sugar. No, it's an addiction. Um, What do you have coming up, Andrea, that you're excited about? Yeah, so I've been doing some more speaking. And so that has been just a a fun thing. I just got back from DC a couple of weeks ago in Baltimore and did some speaking events. And that's been fun to get out and to connect with people in real time. 
Because again, it's ironic, but I spent a lot of time behind a screen doing my work, sharing on social media and writing emails. And it is so ironic. So I don't travel a ton because I want to be here for my kids, but I selectively do say yes to some things and that that's fun. So I, I am excited and looking forward to doing some more speaking in the coming year. That's, that's awesome. really exciting. But being around people again, it's just so exciting. Yes. <laughs> no. I still don't, I'm still not over it after the whole, after the whole COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Andrea. This has been great. And um, parents I know are walking away with great suggestions on how to start these discussions and tech plans with their teens. So thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, Joanne and Bree. It was my pleasure. So there was one time during the interview, Bree, where I was about to break out into song because you said a rap lyric or a song lyric. And I can't remember oh. it now, but it was like, bring it back, bring it back. You said, yeah, let's bring it back. I'm like, bring it oh, back. Bring I it think back. I said, yeah, I did say something that made me start thinking about Greece. I forget what I said too, but there was some <laughs> line totally where I immediately froze. It just jumped in my head. So. Oh, it jumped in your head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was, it's, it's such an interesting interview because a lot of times with screen time, those discussions, that is really where the magic lies with kids because there's no monitoring. You can't follow your child around every second of the day, policing their screen time use. It wouldn't make you happy, wouldn't make the kid happy. So really the education is where it's at when it comes to screen time. Yeah. I think a lot of times, like you just said, we feel so much pressure as parents that we need to, I mean, because they, they, anywhere you go, all the research does say like un, un, um, filtered, un, unwatched content on the internet is not good for your kids. It, so we all agree on that, but the, somehow a concept came through that us as parents, the best way to handle that is for us to be on top of all of it. We need to have all these monitoring things. We need to keep an eye on our kids. We need to like lock up the cell phones. And 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 we're not saying that that's, that's necessarily a bad idea, but it just, to me, feels extremely overwhelming, would cause burnout for me. And if anything goes wrong, I would 100% blame myself. And I, that's just not realistic. It's not a realistic expectation. And like well, there's said, like such like, an interplay now, like with what you have to use it as a tool versus what you use for entertainment. Right. And entertainment's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with entertainment. There's a whole industry made on entertainment. You could go and get a job creating this for people. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. That's a possibility. And I think we're so scared now of just ruining our kids that tech has been one of those things that many people have leached onto, especially moms and moms get the brunt of it because I was, I really wanted to ask questions about the dads. My husband, he's on his device all the time. And it's one of those things where, yeah, you can talk with your kids and monitor your kids. But when you have another adult who uses their screen to unwind, it's a hard thing to navigate because you have this other adult in the house who's on their screen and the kids are like, but they're on their screen. Why can't I be on my screen? First of all, we might need to do a follow-up with Andrea. But second of all, I think that that's part of the whole family tech thing. Because I, yeah, I'm thinking of plenty of times where I've had to be like, excuse me, hello, can we put our phone down? Uh, Mm -hmm. What was it? Devorah Heitner had one about double screening or something like that. Oh, yeah. And I was, as soon as I heard that, I noticed how much my family does that. And I do it too. So it's like, Uh, yeah, okay. I've done it. I've totally done it. I mean, in the car driving last night, my daughter was like, I heard the Instagram reels going. And I'm like, what you doing back there? She's like, I'm watching reels, but I'm driving. And then we got into this whole back and forth because this is what she does. But mom, you're not having a conversation with me. You didn't start the conversation. I'm like, how can I start the conversation? Is it my job to start the conversation all the time? Well, it's not my job to start the conversation all the time. Mom. It just goes back and forth. It's like a little ping pong match with us both where we get into that. And yet you got her off of her screen for that interaction. <laughs> yeah. And the only way I was able to get her, yeah. The only way I was able, I was like to identify the feeling in me that yeah, basically being on the screen creates in people. I'm like, I feel ignored that you're paying attention to your device and you're not starting a conversation with me. And that's when she was able to put it down and be like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because maybe that, I, that is a good point. 
Yeah. When we, when we keep it all like it's going to wreck your brain, that doesn't get through to some kids. But if you're, you're like, I feel ignored, they're like, oh, well, then I'll put this down. Or at least they better understand where you're coming mm-hmm. from and why you're saying what you're saying. So, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, hope, but, hope everybody got a lot of great information about Andrea. We've got her contact information in the show notes below. So reach out. She's got some great courses that she does and her book is phenomenal as well. So yes, lots of out. great discussions. So until next time, remember the best mom is a happy mom. Take care of you. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks for stopping by. Are you looking for something to listen to with your whole family? Then check out Six Minutes, produced and created by Gen Z Media. With over 200 twisty, cliffhanger-filled episodes, Six Minutes tells the story of 11-year-old Holiday who is pulled from the icy waters with no memory of who she is or where she came from. Three years ago, Brindley Pasternak helped the Anders family uncover the truth about Holiday's past. Now she'll need them to help her find the truth about hers. In Six Minutes Out of Time, the long-awaited sequel, Cyrus Anders is found unconscious near the mysterious Elixir Academy in Florida, and Brindley learns the school may have a shocking connection to her missing mother. Dive in now and get the most downloaded family audio adventure in history. Follow Six Minutes wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free with the GZM family subscription.